Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. As a parent, I can appreciate the value of a good toy chest. It's a place to keep the children's playthings out of sight. Today, I'm going to build a play chest that you can store the playthings in and actually play on. I'll show you what I mean in a minute, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Thank you. Oh, twice in a row. I've been playing checkers with my friend Ben here, and he is very good, as you can see. Now, when he's not playing with his checkers, he can store his toys underneath here in a nice big toy chest. I know. You got all kinds of things in there, right, Ben? Yeah. Oh, balls, airplanes, helicopters, everything. This is a great place for your toys, huh? Now, one of the things we had to concern ourselves with is not having the lid slam. So I was able to find these closers, which are very good because you can just let go of the lid, goes down by itself, and there's no chance that a child will get his hand in there. Works good, huh? You up for another one? Hey, yeah. If you have a toy-toting, checker-playing youngster in your home, you may want to build a toy chest like this. We have a measure drawing with the materials list available, and you'll hear more about that before this program ends. Before we start woodworking today, I'd like to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. A hundred years ago, a craftsman who would build a chest like this could easily find boards 18 or 24 inches wide. Old growth, nice straight grain, very stable. That's nearly impossible today. What I had to do is glue boards up. In fact, there's a joint right about here. We took the trouble to match the grain as closely as possible. To accomplish that, I find that if I cut all the pieces from the same length, they match pretty closely. So one 12 foot board was enough to do the front and one end. Here are the four blanks for the sides of the chest. With today's modern glues and good clamps, that's sufficient for this joint. But you know me, a little extra reinforcement doesn't hurt. So I've put biscuits about every 10 inches. Now that the panels are set, I can remove them from the clamps and true them up. The first step in truing up a panel is to take one of the long edges and make it square and straight. The best tool for that is the joiner. The next step is to rip the panel to width, making sure I keep the jointed edge against the rip fence. That assures that the side I've just cut is perfectly parallel. I've set the rip fence 1 16th of an inch wider than the final width I need. Here's where that extra 16th of an inch comes in. I'm going to join that freshly sawn edge, giving me a panel exactly the right width. The next step is to cut the panels to length. And the best tool to do that is my homemade panel cutter. First thing is trim the panel on one end to square it up. Now I'll just flip the panel around, hook my tape on the squared end, and put a mark for my length, which in this case is 42 inches, and trim it off. The corners of the chest are joined with through dovetails, and here's a sample I made to show you the parts. This is the tail piece, and if you look at the shape of these wide sections, it sort of looks like a dove's tail. That's the part I want to see the most, so I'll use that on the front. On the sides, I'll cut the pins, and when it's assembled, you get a very strong joint because it can't move to the side, and I get a lot of glue area 
in between when I assemble it. Now, I had to do a couple things for the long sides of the chest. First, I had to raise up my workbench about six inches so that I could fit the piece in this device, which is a dovetailing jig. Here you see the front piece of the chest. With this jig, there's a series of fingers which can be adjusted to whatever dovetail pattern I would like, simply by loosening and moving the pins and tightening down these square drive bolts. Once the pin layout is set, I also have the dovetail layout. I simply flip the fingers over. Then using my router, which is equipped with a dovetailing bit and this little collar, if I run the collar between this narrow section, I'll cut out the material for the pins, leaving behind this material, which forms the dovetail. Before I cut any pins, I'm going to turn the front piece around and cut the tails on the other end. And then I'll do the same thing to the back panel. Now, with one of the sides clamped in the jig, I flip the finger assembly over. Using my router, which is equipped with the same collar, but switching to a 5 16 inch straight cutting bit, I'll remove the material between the fingers of the jig. The resulting wood underneath the jig gives me the pins. Now just a dry fit of all the dovetail joints. Well, you can see even at this point, there's a lot of strength to those joints. Those seem to be fitting OK. Now along the edge closest to you, which I'm going to designate as the bottom of the toy chest, I need a groove on all four edges to receive the plywood bottom. The groove for the plywood bottom in the long pieces has to stop short of the end. Otherwise, I'll destroy the dovetail. I'll actually have a knot showing at the end. What I have to do is make what's known as a stopped dado. To do that, I'm going to use my router, which is equipped with a guide fence and a half inch bit. I'll place the guide against the edge of the board, plunge the router into the work, go down to the other end, stop just short, and remove the router. Now here on the end pieces, the groove can run all the way through because it doesn't show. Before I do any assembly of the chest, I want to sand all the inside surfaces. Now's the time to take care of that. Now before I start to do any assembly, I'm going to put a little masking tape right along the edge of the dovetail joints. And what that does is prevent some of the glue from spreading on the inside of the chest, making it much easier to clean up later. The trick here is that I have to move real quickly because I can't put anything together until I have all the glue applied. And I don't want to let the glue dry out at the same time. Okay, let's slip this side piece in first. Now the other side. Okay, with the clamp set, there's one more thing I want to do before I set this aside to dry, and that's to remove this tape. It's done its job, but I don't want it to end up stuck there permanently. While the glue sets up, let's turn our attention to the top and the checkerboard. The top is another piece of MDO plywood, except this is 3 quarters of an inch thick. What I want to do is route out an area so that I can install these square pieces of hardwood that form the checkerboard. To do that, I'm going to use a straight edge clamp that I've put in position as a guide. The distance between the edge of the clamp 
and my layout line is equal to the distance from the edge of the router to the cutting edge of the bit. I've set the depth of the bit to a little bit under a quarter of an inch. Now I've switched to a longer clamp to cut the front and back edges of the inlay area. Because there's no room to put the clamp out on the outer edge, I've had to move it to the inside of my layout line, which also means that I have to increase the distance from the line to the clamp, because now I want to have the distance from the edge of the router to the far side of the bit. To remove the rest of the area of the inlay, I'm going to start with my router at one corner and move back and forth until I get to the other corner, always leaving a good base for the router. Well now just a little bit of time cleaning up the corners with a sharp chisel and I think we'll call it a day. I'm getting started this morning by continuing working on the top of the chest. I have a pine curb that runs around the plywood top. The back corners are joined with dovetails, just like the bottom of the chest. Well, once again, just as I did with the bottom of the chest, I've milled some stop dados in the side rails of the top to receive the plywood. I've just cut a curve on the front edge of the side rails. That'll be sanded smooth at the drum sander. To ease the top edges of the rails, I'm rounding over the corners with a quarter inch radius roundover bit. Okay, that fits pretty well. Now I'm in no hurry to put the front edge on this piece right now. I'll just clamp it up and set it aside to dry. At the bottom edge of the chest, I've installed a decorative base. It has an OG detail at the top. I'll show you how to do that. The bit that I'm going to use in my router is known as a 5 30 seconds OG bit. Because I have to run the edge along the narrow part of the board, I don't have a very stable base. Since I have to run two pieces, I'm just going to clamp them together in my bench dogs and now I have a much better support area to run the edges. By making two passes on my table saw, I've created a rabbit in that decorative molding. That allows it to sit under the edge of the chest, all the way around. The corners will get mitered and then reinforced with a biscuit. The accessory fence on my biscuit joiner makes it easy to cut biscuit slots in 45 degree miters. The base molding is just glued in the rabbet to the bottom of the chest and I'll slip my biscuits in down through the slot.
Now these nails will hold it while the glue sets up. Let me show you how I make the squares for the checkerboard. I had a couple scraps of wood left over from a previous project. A piece of maple and a piece of mahogany. I like the contrast of the woods for the checkerboard. The first thing I want to do is plane both pieces so that they're exactly an inch and a half thick. And one of the ways to do that is with a surface planer. The next step is to rip these pieces into quarter inch strips. Now I need to cut these strips into one and a half inch long pieces. To do that, I've set up a stop block on my miter saw, made a couple test pieces. Now I'll cut them in groups of three at a time. Next, I dry fit the pieces in the mortised area. So far, so good. They're fitting OK. I also took the time to alternate the grain. The maple, it runs this way. The mahogany, this way. All right, that's all the pieces dry fit. Now, I could pull each piece out one at a time and glue them in place, but that would take forever. So what I'm going to do is put some masking tape over the entire surface so that I can pull it out as a unit, apply some contact cement, then reset it into the mortised area. Now just use a pencil to make a mark to key one corner. And hopefully I'll be able just to pop the whole thing out of here. Well, now the contact cement is dry to the touch on both surfaces. So now I want to set it back into position, making sure to align the two witness marks, get it right in the corner, set into the mortise, drop it into place, work it in around the edges. Okay. Now just use this J roller to exert some nice even pressure on all the pieces to make sure the bond is complete. Now I'll just peel off the masking tape and give the entire surface some sanding. Let me show you the sliding tray for the checkers. It's a piece of MDO plywood with a hardwood runner that rides in a hardwood track. All these pieces can be made at the table saw. The first step is to make a quarter inch groove in the center of two edges of the plywood tray using my quarter inch dado head cutter. This is one of the hardwood tracks. It receives a groove right down the center. This operation creates a tongue on each edge of this piece. Later, I'll split it in half, and that will yield a runner for each edge of the tray. Before I split it, I've run dados down the center part of the piece to form tongues which will fit into the tracks I made earlier.
Now the runners are installed with just a little bit of glue. No nails, I'll just clamp it. The tracks get attached to the bottom of the lid with glue and screws. These pine pieces will hold the lid level when it's closed and will also be used to attach the lid supports. Now I'm drilling some inch and three-eighths diameter holes with a Forstner bit to hold the checkers. The front edge of the lid and the front of the tray are cut out of one piece of pine, and that's a little tricky. The safest way to do it is to take the blank of pine and clamp it to the saw table, then raise the blade through it. With the blade back down below the wood, I'll unclamp the piece, move it forward, clamp it down again, bring the blade up, and complete the cut. Now I'll just use my miter gauge to make the cross cuts. In order to be able to pull the tray out without opening the lid, I milled a finger pull in the bottom of the pine strip using a cove bit. And this pine strip gets attached with more biscuits and glue. Using a laminate trimming bit with a ball bearing that's riding on a temporary piece of pine that I set in place, I can trim the back rail so that I'll be able to mortise a place for my piano hinge. But I'm in no hurry to install the hardware yet. It's a lot easier to finish this piece without the piano hinge and the closers. Now for our toy chest, all the pine parts, I took the time to put on a couple coats of gloss polyurethane. This MDO board was always meant to be painted, so I put some masking tape over the pine and the checkerboard, selected an acrylic latex paint that I wanted, and now I'm just putting on a couple thin coats. The polyurethane over the latex paint really gave us an exceptional finish on this piece. Some people say it looks so good that it shouldn't be a toy box. Maybe it should be a blanket chest or perhaps a hope chest. But I really like the checkers, although I better find some time for some practice.